to Forbidden Knowledge News. I'm your host, Chris Matthew, and I want to welcome back to the show the awesome author and amazing researcher of ancient history, ancient cuneiform texts, Matthew LaCroix. Matthew, how are you doing today? Great. It's awesome to be back here. Of course, some of my favorite topics. So who, you know, who couldn't be excited, right? <laughs> awesome. Well, we appreciate you joining us. And every once in a while with returning guests, I like to get your, uh, a little bit about your background again and what brought you to your current path. Okay. So I was, I was someone who really, I, believe it or not, I really didn't um, study this stuff or look into ancient history secrets or, or any of that when I was young. I was someone who just spent all this time out in the woods, running around, hiking mountains and exploring. And that was my side of it, seeing this whole side of um, the connections found in balances seen throughout nature and then seeing the unbalances in our society and, and how we treat our world, you know, trashing it and ignoring all of it. And people just driving the highway and running over animals and not even caring. It's, it was like the sickness of our world. And I, it, it drove me to the point where I was, when I was younger, to start trying to figure out what was going on from, from, that, from that side. And after um, pushing the limits of myself, going off alone and camping in some, in some wild areas where I shouldn't have been and getting almost in, in, a, lot of, in a lot of trouble. And in many cases, um, I, I did have situations where uh, I probably could have got either seriously hurt or, or lost my life. But because of those moments, it drove me to want to write them down. And that's where all of my, my career as being a, as being a writer as, as my secondary job um, started. And, and then that's where the whole ancient history thing began. Because I, as I started writing down and looking into, into my perspective of how I viewed society and how I saw, you know, the balance of nature and everything, and I wrote my first book was actually called My Wilderness because it was this idea of my perspective on, on how I viewed um, the world and the experiences that I was having, you know, my, the, my, my experiences. And, and I'm subsequently going back to redo that book. But the, it, what really happened to me was um, in college, I started really researching this stuff. And after college, I got on a, a path, I guess like a lot of people could say, where they really – they they feel like they want to know answers you know it's not enough to and there's a lot of different kinds of individuals you know some people will be satisfied with learning more of a base understanding of how reality works around them and then they feel like they have a grasp on things so what do they do they just they put it down and they go back to their life and they move on right they're they're done you know or people are in college and they they're studying for years and years and they think it's all the same. So they think, oh, I'm done. I'm not going to ever research, research or look into things again. And unfortunately, that's a pretty large segment of our population are people that decide that they're, they're done learning and they just move on with their life. In reality, like a lot of our tr us truthers know, is once you start going down this road, you realize that you don't really know that much at all because there's been a lot of things hidden and there's been a lot of means which have blocked off our understanding of, of the fundamentals of both ancient history and reality because of a tightly controlled curriculum that was designed through by the, the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers um, years and years and years ago that is taught in every school. And that's why people are, when they start looking into the Sumerians and all of the, the advanced knowledge that they had that they got out of nowhere and they developed basically everything that we know of today in terms of the fundamentals of agriculture, governing laws, mathematics, that all came from them. And yet it's the Sumerians aren't even really taught in school. There's, there's, there's not even, there's not even classes really that cover them. If people happen to get into some special class that's being offered in college, then congratulations to them. But I never had those opportunities. And I don't think most people do either. And so when I started going down this road, it became apparent to me that there was a lot of information that was jumbled and just left out there with these breadcrumbs from all these ancient societies. And they were trying to tell us something. They were trying to tell us a story. And so I then got on this road of saying, well, what is our story? And what is the story of history? And, and, and that's where we, how we get, get to where we get today because I was someone who had the opportunity to have some time, which is, I understand is, is, a, is a critical component in all of this. If you don't have time, how are you supposed to do any of this? 
especially if your energy is all drained through working and spending all of your, your precious, precious time. And then you, you don't have any ability to be able to find these things out. And I think, I do think that's one of the brilliance, the brilliant things about YouTube is it does, does get people if they're objective in what they're picking and what they're looking at, it gives them the opportunity to um, listen to something, maybe perhaps when they wouldn't be able to read or study something, right? Right. I don't know if you can hear that, but it is storming in the background back wow. here. Yeah, that is rain. So if we happen to go out, I'll reconnect on my cell phone, but uh, just letting you know, that's what that background noise is. It is uh, storming out here, but sorry, go ahead and continue. Yeah, that's, that's, that's fine. Um, so I, I wrote uh, eventually, and I, I actually, I think I rushed it a little bit too much early on, releasing the illusion of us because I really wanted so much of this information to get to get out. And so, you know, after the second version and all the different, all the time I went back in to try to make it perfect, um, I I'm learning those lessons. I'm learning those lessons right now because I'm trying to release the third book, which is, I think is by far the most important one that I've written. And I'm trying to slow down and make sure that I get everything f based on evidence and, f and facts. So I'm, that's what I've been spending my time over the last year and, and slowly and slowly doing l less and less shows because I'm trying to get this done. Um, so I'm, ex I'm excited to release this. It's going to be called the stage of time and it's really going to delve into understanding it's a little bit more of an advanced book than the illusion of us. It's delving into understanding, well, what makes up our reality? You know, how does, what, what really defines it? Is it defined by what we see or is it defined by something like super string theory in this electromagnetic universe? Is that, is that what really defines our universe in all these ways? And, but then moving beyond just that, I wanted to bring in the whole ancient history aspect of explaining these antediluvian civilizations and the separation point for why we lost so much technology and knowledge and, and how, you know, we're made to believe we live in a, a world surrounded by billions of other planets and, and solar systems and yet it's all empty. And, and then, you know, there's never been any influence with, with any of developing human societies and any of that. And so this book is going to take all of these juicy pieces of evidence from like the Atrahasis and the Enuma Elish and the Emerald Tablets and um, so many other places too. It's going to take so many of these juicy pieces and it's going to have direct um, translations from the best translators that have done this. And it's going to look into well, what really is the story of the past, the present, and what is the truth of our reality. And so that's what I've been um, really um, consumed with, I guess you could say. And I'm r right at the end of finishing it and going back through and, and um, getting it up to where it needs to be. But I'm hoping I can have that released a little bit after the new year. That will be awesome. We'll be very much looking forward to that. I mean, those topics are amazing. And it brings us to some of the things that I'd love to talk about tonight. And you mentioned, I'm glad that you mentioned our education system and how they don't teach anything real to begin with, let alone any real history. And you've done such amazing research into the Sumerian cultures and the ancient cuneiform. And let's begin there. But let's not only begin there, let's begin with where we come from. Okay. Um, Anunnaki beings, were they our creators? Uh, did they create us from something that was already existing here? What are your thoughts? Okay. Uh, before I jump into that, I want to just let people know that I'm gonna, we're going to be going through some topics that I've never discussed before. And you know some of these some of these things I've I've, I've gone over in a, in a few shows, and I don't want to be redundant. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with some human origin stuff with some Madra Hasis and, and some other various readings that I that I've just to just to give us um, a base so that we can delve into some of these more complex topics like you know the Nephilim and some of these really neat things that Magellan saw, and we're going to go into um, Emerald Tablet Number Two and some other various various um, pieces of evidence that are really pretty amazing and, and, and unknown to a lot of people. So let me, let me start by sharing uh, a few slides while we have this discussion. When you think of the past and you think of, you know, where humans came from and you, and you look around at the animal kingdom, I think one of the greatest means that has held back our society and our consciousness from understanding the larger truths of where we belong and what we're part of is by, is by 
thrusting us in this Darwinian model of us being just simply an animal like the rest of the animal kingdom. And a lot of people maybe aren't really um, aware of how destructive that mentality is. If someone feels that way, which a lot of most people do because that's been what's thrust and taught to us through all these different means, it's this idea that we got to this point simply based on survival of the fittest and by stepping on everything else to get here. That's essentially what that means, you know, kill whatever is attacking you, conquer everything you can around you, and then become this powerful civilization that is these advanced monkeys, right? That's, that's what they want us to believe is what's happening. And that there's no outside influences in that, you know, this whole, you know, pool of ooze gets struck by lightning and then you have these, you know, macroinvertebrates and all these things that come out of this and then eventually all of these different millions of species come out of it and eventually human beings come out of apes. And that's what we're taught. Right. And I want to talk about how that's not what ancient history says. And that's not what the evidence says at all. The ev evidence is actually quite the contrary. It is, and, and I think that's one of the problems is that when someone, when people start looking at some of these tablets and some of the informations from these, some of these ancient cultures, when they compare it to such a mundane viewpoint that we've been given, uh, you know, like about like what I just said about having how us we're, we're nothing, right? And that's that mentality. Nothing special, just an evolved ape. You can take get whatever wealth you can, accumulate whatever you can, have this, you know. Get as and much as you can. Kind of like that way by the by the elites as well. That like we're nothing. They with the food that we eat and the the air that we breathe. You know they they kind of enforce that we are basically nothing as well. Exactly. If if you were trying to keep people people from knowing their true um, energy potential and what they really are, the one of the best ways to do it besides hiding all this information would be to dumb them down and sicken them so much that their entire vibrational structure of their energy is so low that they are functioning as a primitive being. That's essentially what they've done to us. They've, look, at, look at the news that just came out. We're looking at this Glyos fate or whatever that, that new, um, you know, with, with Monsanto is, is basically yeah, the spraying, yeah, spraying on wheat to try to have it so pests and mold and various things don't, don't ruin it. And yet that's uh, extremely harmful and dangerous and it, it can cause cancer and it's in almost every single cereal that's been promoted to all these kids. It's just yeah. like when we saw this big news announcement come out saying that um, these salted meats and these cured meats can cause cancer. And yet look at Lunchables and all of these, these foods that were being given to developing children to, so they could, they could, you know, be strong and healthy. And, and at the same, what was it actually doing? It was, it was sickening everybody, causing, causing people to be less than their potential would have been. And not even just that, causing them to exist in a state of energy that they don't belong in. That's the most important point that we're going to get to. As we go through all of this, we're going to get through and discuss the, the finer points of the fact that we are nothing like the animals in the, in the, in the insects and all the other things that are in our world. We are completely separate from that. And we should view ourselves that way, not in an elitist way, but as more of stewards that should be taking care of this planet. And yet we're just trashing and stealing all of its, you know, oil and, and gas and burning it all and destroying our world and filling our oceans with plastic. Is that how, you know, beings that have higher consciousness and, may come from the stars. Is that how they really should be acting? Look at one of the things that sickens me the most is if, if you look at the idea, if you think about the idea that if we are these great beings, the fact that we could be um, physically assaulting and attacking each other and killing each other in wars and all these different means is, is really gets even more disgusting when you separate it out beyond Darwinism because it's, it's such a primitive nature. It's such a primitive means that it, it's very sad to me to see how people have been so conditioned to exist in that state. And so let's, let's start here, right? You have this question mark at the bottom right in the screen. What right. is this missing link? Where did we come from? Where did all this start? Well, I want to get a little bit of background and some of these things I've covered, but I want to, I want to bring them up again. And if we look at 
cuneiform tablets from Mesopotamia. That's where you need to start. That's really where you need to start, but you need to get pure translations. Be very careful. I would, I would essentially stick with um, the translations of George Smith and Stephanie Daly with some Zechariah Sitchin, but we need to mix we need to mix um, the sources of information and then object objectively view them rather than just getting everything from one place. Because if someone was to make mistakes, which some of them have, you essentially would be getting your source of information from only one place. And that's a really dangerous thing to do. So if you get, if you get translations done from different people, from different angles, and they happen to correlate, that's how you know you have truth. At least as much truth as you can get without running into the idea that they could have been manipulated in the past, which I absolutely believe could be possibly true, but we can't know that. So we have to go with the evidence we have and we have to try to objectively figure out using, using logic to come up with plausible, plausible con uh, conclusions for these things. And what they, what they essentially say, when you read something like the Atrahasis, one of these cuneiform tablets from Mesopotamia, which by the way, is one of the only cuneiform tablets that's been translated and carried over by multiple civilizations. So you had, you had Sumer, you had Babylon, you had, you had several of these uh, in a, up in Assyria where it was originally, where it was originally found in the library of Ashurbanipal. You have several of these different cultures that have retranslated this because of the importance of what it contained, okay? And essentially what the Atrahasis says is this. Long ago, hundreds of thousands of years ago, there were beings that came here, okay? And beings that are far more advanced than we are that can, that can even be, have the ability to have their consciousness possibly separate from themselves and be able to incarnate into somebody or even be able to influence other, other dimensions below them because they're, they're more advanced beings. But they came here and they had... Uh, you could call it a physical workforce or just non-royal members. Because really, look at these families. Look at these, look at these royal families on our planet that are still here. Look at the Rothschilds. Look at the, the Queen and all these, these royal families that have these elite bloodlines. The only reason they're like that is because it was, it was simply carried down and handed down from above. These beings have that type of governing structure. They have a royal hierarchy system where they were and then below them they have basically other beings that are advanced but they're not royal status so they do a lot of the work for these beings that's what they are and they're known as the ajiji now these, these beings, go ahead these beings are they interdimensional beings or are they actually from a different planet they're definitely, they're definitely trans-dimensional, interdimensional, which means they have the ability to, to move between different dimensions. Now, humanity, everything, everything you see around you in the physical world, that's part of the third dimension, okay? And the third dimension is where matter becomes physical, but there's a lot of other dimensions both above and below it. And because of that, what we see and what we perceive is largely just a small piece of that, okay? And so these beings have the ability to basically master these dimensions. And if you have a being that exists in a lower state of energy that can really only perceive, perceive with its physical eyes the third dimension, but only have the capability to glimpse, I say glimpse, having to do with our consciousness and things like love, which go beyond the third dimension, that those are fourth and fifth dimensional attributes. And that's where consciousness resides. So if you want to, if you want to really think about what defines our, our experience here, what, do, what you and I are talking right now, what you see, this is, our, this is absolutely a, a, a brilliantly designed biological body where it's, it's like an antenna basically that can, if it's healthy enough, tunes into higher and higher states of consciousness that, can, that then have the ability to allow that biological body to reach higher states of energy. That's what we are. And, and that's why these beings and some of these families and some of these, some of these some of those who don't want humans to reach a higher, higher states of energy, they simply just keep them through conditioning, through food, through water, through all these different means. They simply just keep them in their lowest state of energy. And, and that's, if you think about what that is, it's, it's an energy prison because, if, because we don't belong here. We belong in higher states of energy. And that's why it's so disgusting to look at the fact that our, if, once you know a lot of this stuff and then you look back, at thousands of years of war, 
with millions of people that have been brutally murdered and killed. It's just, it's horrible to, to look at how our reality has been shaped. And so what these cuneiform tablets say, the Atrahasis, is it says that that these GG were on this planet and there was no other humans here. There was early hominids and they were doing all the work. They were doing all the work for these beings, whether or not it was mining or whether or not it was clearing out channels in, in these river channels, which is what they specifically says in the Atrahasis they were doing. The Fertile Crescent, which is where Iraq and Syria and, and all those areas are, is where we see the, mo the, be the best evidence for these advanced civilizations and where they developed. And that's only because these beings went there first. That's where they went to create these civilizations and then start out. They were there before human civilizations. And the reason you know that is because when you read in the Andrahasis, it talks about how these Ajiji were clearing the lifelines of the land, these rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Because if you don't clear them, because they're running through such um, sandy and, and rocky areas, they get filled with um, sediment and, and dust and all these things, and they become clogged. And so if you don't clear them, they, they turn into these mud pits, and then you can't get any water out of them. And what were they clearing them for? They needed it for water for, for agricultural purposes and, and for feeding themselves. And that's why you see this continued common interest in needing some kind of a labor force to be able to supply them with energy and, and food and all these things. Because you had these beings, again, that are higher beings who are being forced to do manual labor in the third dimension. And they don't want to do it. So eventually, this is where this 3,600 year comes, number comes from. After 3,600 years, these Ajiji beings, they revolted. And they actually took over and they, they demanded relief and they, didn't, they weren't going to do this work anymore. That's not what they were made for, okay? And that's where the story begins. Now, these translations of the Atrahasis, as I mentioned, they're, because there's been a lot of stigma behind Zechariah Sitchin. He got a lot of things right. He got a few things wrong. But George Smith, and, George Smith first, first of all, translated the Atrahasis almost 100 years before, um, before anyone else. And that's, that's important because it represents a, an unpolluted viewpoint. And then Stephanie Daly came later in the 70s and 80s, and she further uh, agreed upon the same translations. Almost no changes were made. And so I want to show some of these, some of what was said, and then we're going to get into some of these really interesting topics like where, what are the origins of, the, of these beings and um, what is the truth of the Nephilim and some, some of these other really interesting topics. And I want to read a, a very short paragraph. Yeah, Go ahead. No, I think that some of the, the reasons that we only hear about Stitchin's work is they just only want one viewpoint out there uh, as opposed to hearing all the ones that like you're speaking of to get a better understanding of what's going on. Exactly. And what do they do? They say Zechariah Stitchin had no professional training and then they discredit him. How are you going to discredit Stephanie Daly? She's one of the top Assyrian experts in the world. She's, she teaches at Oxford University. She's still alive and she's got several books. And, she, and so you have these experts who have translated this. And wait a minute, I thought the Anunnaki was all, oh, the word Anunnaki was made up by Zechariah Sitchin. No, it's not. And you're going to see that as I, when, I, when I read it right now. It's not at all. And that's, that's something we need to really make a point of is that these, these beings were first mentioned, they're called that because that was the first civilization that knew of them. And they called them that because they're actually called the Anuna, A-N-U-N-N-A. -N -N -A. They're called the Anuna, and then the, the Sumerians simply called them the Anunnaki because it represented them coming down to Earth, which is, that's what Earth is. Earth, the name of Earth is actually K-I, which is really interesting, the, the, word, the word key, right? Um, and so I want to read a, a, a very brief um, quote from tablet one of the Atrahasis, which also echoes the Enuma Elish on tablet six. So that, again, this, if you find correlation, that's, some, that's something you want to pay attention to because that usually leads you more towards the truth. Um, I'm just going to take a paraphrase from, from tablet number one of the Atrahasis, but this is essentially what it says in regards to human creation and, and the jumpstart that occurred to us. It says, Enlil sent for Anu to be brought down to him. Enki was fetched into his presence. Anu, king of the sky, was present. Enki, king of the Absu, was present. All of the great Anunnaki were present. The Ajiji declared, 
Every single one of us has declared war. We have put a stop to the digging. The load is excessive. It is killing us. Anu made his voice heard and spoke to, his, to the gods, his brothers. What are we complaining of? Their work was indeed too hard. Their trouble too much. Anu made his voice heard and, and uh, sorry, Ea made his voice heard and spoke. Let us create a mortal man so that he may bear the yoke, the work of Enlil. Remember that, the work of Enlil. Let man bear the load of the gods. Nintu made her voice heard and spoke. On the first, seventh, and fifteenth of the month, I shall make a purification by washing. Then I shall, then one god shall be slaughtered. Then a god and a man will be mixed together in clay. Let a god, let a ghost come into existence from the god's flesh. And let the ghost exist, so not to forget the slain god. And I th just think about what that means for a minute. A ghost, consciousness, okay? So that they, cr they could create a being that would be advanced enough that what we think of as, as human consciousness, advanced consciousness, would be able to incarnate into it. And that's something that I think a lot of people, it, it, it gets past people. It's like, well, what about animals and, and, other, and other biological creatures that don't have, you know, a certain brain capacity and type of energy capacity. I don't think that all, I think all consciousness has a common, a common source, but I think that individual consciousness is what defines us, which is eternal. And that's where the whole karma and reincarnation comes from because we do have our own unique conscious energy. And I think to allow that conscious energy of, of, that we are that's higher dimensional to be able to come into a biological hominid being you have to have that being have to be at a certain point Me, what, what does that mean if they wanted to create a being that um was essentially stupid and would just be uh an animal that would follow basic orders they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't have higher consciousness it just wouldn't it wouldn't happen okay it'd be a much more basic type of creature but instead, instead of that, we had a situation where we have this incredible biological design, and I'll get into that more, where we have this ability to, to, to tune into our higher states of consciousness, and that's what we are. We're all these, you know, we're all these cr creator gods here that are in this body that are being tormented and used in our lowest form of energy to just give up all our energy to never, never advance and reach higher levels. It's, it's quite amazing if you sit back and you look at it from an outside perspective of what we are and what we're doing. It, and that's the whole point behind a movie like the matrix. Um, that's what it's trying to get at the whole time. Um, now with that translation, I just read from the autohesis, a lot of that is hidden in symbols and metaphors. It's one of the things that Thoth talks about is how a lot of this has been cleverly and deliberately hidden. Because what would happen if it wasn't? If all of this was written in plain tongue, simple, right? Instead of saying they mixed something like clay together in a slain god, what if they just talked about how they took a, a, a primitive biological hominid and, and genetically jump-started? Like, they don't use those words. Why? Because this information is part of being, un that's, it's made to be uncovered through, an, through agreements that were made. Made to be uncovered by those who have the ability to uncover it so that if so if someone wasn't in a certain conscious level and they hadn't reached a certain unbalance and they're not on a certain path in life they can't just find this and immediately understand it all because the reason behind that is everything is protected so that you ever heard that that that, that phrase you know with with great power comes great responsibility right Right. That's the same thing with us is that we are not allowed to reach these higher states of energy. That's been designed that way by these beings, unless we are able to get through certain roadblocks and reach and certain um, do certain things in our life to prove our worth. And part of that is simply is, is studying hard and, and, and learning the reality around you and going down that long, hard road that most don't, don't take because it's really difficult. It's really hard. You get rewarded by doing that, by, by reading things like this and being like, I understand what that's saying, I think. And other people are saying, I have no clue. And that's, that's the difference. And, and then those people that are understanding it are the same ones that are reaching higher states of consciousness. It's all connected. It's all, it's all connected in this. And 
So essentially what the, what the Atreasis says is, and, and what a lot of other, other cuneiform writings say from Mesopotamia, is that somewhere around 200,000 years ago, roughly, and in the, in the human genome, if you, if you look at the sequencing and the age and what they think maybe how, how far back it was, that's some, also some agreement that's been made there too. In this, in this time frame, it doesn't mean it's exactly that, but it's, it means a lot longer ago than we've been told. Oh, yeah. You know, the whole human story is, is given to us in, in something like 10 to 20,000 years, when as yeah. really it's several hundred thousand years, quite a bit longer. And that's a long time. Think about what you could do, uh, civil, civilizations could do in 10,000 years. And think about what civilizations could do in 200,000 years comparison. There's so much of human history that's been left out and suppressed and kept away from us that we don't know about, okay? Now, the first thing I want to bring up is that these beings on the right, Enlil and Enki, these, who's also, who was originally called Ea, they, they're not simply metaphors for things like the sun and the moon and the planets and uh, the different, um, these are not just the, uh, the archetypes of human nature. That's something that the experts tell everyone, in, everyone and a lot of people, even people who are very smart will say, okay, that's fine. They're all just made up. Then how could every culture all across the world echo the same exact information, knowledge, and the certain traits that these, that these beings have had? I'm not saying that these beings have physically been involved in every single culture and like telling them what to do and handed them. But I think they were all based in, on, on ancient, ancient influences that have been able to carry through because, and we're going to talk about what I, what I, what that means um, as we go on. But so they, these beings came here again, like I said, the Yajiji were, didn't want to work anymore. They needed some kind of a physical being to work in the third dimension, to labor here in this planet because they, they were very interested in two things. One, they were very interested in, in the, harnessing the energy of our planet because I think some planets, depending on their, their specific electromagnetic energy and, and the capability of what they have, some have far more energy than others. And if you're an energy being or if you're just trying to harness energy, that'd be one of the things you'd be really interested in is some kind of a crystal energy grid, which is what they say existed here long, long ago by, by other civilizations that had come here you know, way before they arrived. Okay. And we're going to talk about that as we go on. But so here you have the situation where you have these, these, these hominid beings and they've been called, it looks like a combination of Neanderthal and Denisovians. These are, and these were absolutely the early hominids that were here, but they're not simply just an evolved ape. There was, there was other steps and stages involved that, that also had a, had a hand in, in them reaching the next stage that they were because a Neanderthal and a Denisovian is, is much more advanced than, than, a, than an ape or a gorilla. I think part of it, we've been made to believe that maybe they're, they were just like apes, but they really weren't. Actually, Neanderthals, could, um, could, they were much stronger and, and had other attributes that we don't have that we, have, we actually have lost since then. So these, 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 these Anuna beings, these Anunnaki that are here, they trying to figure out what to do. How do they make a being? How do they make a worker that they can do this work? So they, because they're advanced hominids themselves, they needed the ability to, to have some similarity so that they could use their genetics to jumpstart one of these beings. Okay. So they took these Neanderthals and Denisovians. And like I said, well, this, this question mark right here, that's where that comes from. That's why you have a doubling of brain size out of nowhere. And why you have these really strange incursions into the human genome. So they essentially, they essentially jump-started the, the human genome. And today, and if people don't believe that, I'll tell you, to, I'll ask you to look at one piece of evidence only. Ignore all this if you want to. Go study our genes. Go study our genome and go read about what scientists call junk D DNA, but what's really called non-coding DNA. You can manipulate the past information all you want, but, but DNA holds secrets that can't be um, ignored or suppressed in terms of hiding it. It's there. And if they look, they're going to find it. And so you look at, you look at this aspect of what is non-coding DNA? What is that, man? Well, 
if, if we are a Darwinian ape that evolved naturally on this planet, what non-coding DNA is, is it basically provides the missing link that separates this entire thing. It proves that we're not an evolved ape because what it means is non-coding simply means it doesn't share DNA with any other species on the planet. That's simply what it means. So if you think about, oh, well, we share a certain percentage with cows and monkeys and fish and look, see, we're just like them because we share this percentage. How it really works with DNA is you have a base that's developed that takes up the majority of what the DNA is. It's like, it's the base of that, of that design. But what really separates um, these huge leaps and these gaps in, in the DNA of one species to another in terms of one being more advanced than the other is, are these small things. And that's why when you look at the percentage of non-coding DNA, it may not be huge, but it still doesn't, doesn't represent any other species on the planet. And it is the reason why if you take the combination of the fact that our brain is so much longer, longer, larger, and we have this DNA, it shows you the fact that we became separated from the animal kingdom a long time ago, hundreds of thousands of years ago, um, to be more, to be more specific. So, and I think, I think it's yeah. very interesting that you brought up that they are actually advanced hominids. They are basically advanced human beings and that's a big misunderstanding as well a lot of people think that these are aliens you know green beings with antennas and stuff but they're just actually advanced beings from different uh dimensions well okay well let's think about it for a minute if if we knowing what we know about the universe and knowing what we know about biological beings there can only be a couple variations you either have a hominid being which is the mammal side that, I mean, the, the, whatever branches of that, that, that diverge, right? And they're much taller than us, though. I got to point that out. They're not like we are. They're, wherever they come from is so much larger that they're able to be large. They're able to be taller because we're designed specifically for the gravity and the, the, the specifics of our planet, how, how the electro, electromagnetic grid here works. Now, but so what does that mean? Well, it means that beings could really, in my mind, only come in three groups, you either have some kind of a hominid being, you have some kind of a reptile being, or you, which is a dinosaur essentially, it, but, but beyond that, or you have some kind of an insect being. There's, there's really only three groups that could really reach higher states from, from under our current understanding that could reach higher states. And I don't think that there's, in, there's it's, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily saying that there's all these insectoids and reptilians and all these things everywhere all over the place. I think that some of these beings reach such high states of advancement that they no longer look, look like what we would perceive as being like a reptilian being. In many ways, they may look a lot like a hominid or something because I think they, these states of energy and higher consciousness in a biological being eventually take on a more advanced form. So, I, so we shouldn't be surprised that, that the Anunnaki are, are advanced humanoids considering the fact that you, they, they're the ones who, who need, needed to use their genetics to jumpstart us. So if, we, if they weren't humanoids, then how would they be compatible to do that? There's the, the proof behind that, and not to mention all the different ways that they're shown, which is shown as this tall, horned helmet being, in most cases, you know, that's usually a lot taller than, than, the, than those around them. So I want to bring up this really important point. Who created the Neanderthals and Denisovians then? Where did, all of, where did all of this come from and what's the whole point of the story? It really comes down to, if you, if you delve into the ancient cultures all over the world, um, some, of the, some of the ancient Asian, Southeast Asian cultures and some of the Mayans and the Hopi, they talk about how you know, beings long ago had created their ancestors before, but some of them actually don't mention anything about the Anunnaki. Some, some of them specifically mention the Palladian star system, okay, which I believe is the same as the Anunnaki. I believe the Anunnaki are just, they're just beings that are part of different places that are part, the only reason they're called that is that's the group of them, that they were, that, that royal family group is known of that probably has, is, is grouped up with probably people, you know, they're probably from Sirius and Orion and the Pleiades and they're Pleiades and they're all together in this this group in our solar system and that's what they've called themselves. Okay. Okay. That's what I think the difference is between them. And so I think 
I think we had a situation where something like the ancient um, Pleiadian civilization came here long before 200,000 years ago and had a specific plan for how these Neanderthals and Denisovians would eventually end up through something like macro evolution, okay, versus micro, looking at the differences between how a species can change on a, on a, on a, on a, lo, a small level versus how it can change on a major level, okay? And I think they, they probably the idea is they probably come back after certain time periods and just slowly tweak and change things over time rather than just this huge jump start like we saw. So I think in many ways, these beings, these Anunnaki beings who came here, they disrupted both the energy grids that were here on the planet and disrupted the genetic genome of these Neanderthal Denisovians. And that's what led to us. So you could think of us as being, we're really not supposed to be in this place yet. It's, we're, we're too early. You know, we're way before we were supposed to ever reach this point. And, and that's why there's so much chaos because we're like these we're like these children who are incarnating into these incredible bodies with higher consciousness, and yet we're not really ready for it in many ways. And, and so we, that's one of the reasons why it's so easy to trick our demiurges and keep us in such a lower state of energy. So I want to talk about, Chris, do you have any questions on that before we move on? No, no, I just I found that was very fascinating. And just that I had... Um, there must have been some kind of split along the way in the um, or a disagreement in how we were supposed to go um, among the uh, leaders or the hierarchy of the Anunnaki because yes. of the, the suppression along the way. But I'm sure you're going to get to that. Actually, I, I guess I should bring that up. Let me, let me, let me bring that up. That's a really good point. One of the things I talk about a lot is the whole idea that in this Royal Council of 12, they call them, okay? They've had the many names for them. They call it the Elohim. They've been called the Council of 12, the Anunnaki. Um, there's, there's a lot of different names that they've been called. And they, they became greatly, this, and this is one of the, the reasons why, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. It's one of the reasons why we see so much conflict we see today is that Enlil, remember the work of Enlil, when I mentioned in the, in the Adrahasis, the work of Enlil, he was in charge of the physical labor on the earth, on the planet, okay? So you have this group of royal beings and they have certain names and their names are not like the names we have. The names that they have are names that have been given based on their title. So Enlil and Ki is simply just a way of saying they're lords of something. So En meant lord. So Lil, lord of the sky, lord of the upper dimensions and governing the physical dimension. And then Ki would essentially, and, it's, and Ki's name is essentially lord of the earth and specifically fresh water and, and inner earth, okay? Because they, I think some of them, they basically consider the third dimension part of, part of um, the role of Enlil instead of Enki, which, by the way, if that, had been ch if that had decision had been different, everything would have been ch changed in our history. Because what happened was, essentially, there was this great divide that developed between these beings. Because Ia, Enki, was this master geneticist, um, the Australians actually called, they actually said he was um, the great serpent and one of the great creators of the universe. So we don't even know how powerful these beings are. But, but Ia, Enki, the great serpent, dragon, he was this master geneticist. And, and the, one of the amazing things about it is that I found so fascinating, no matter how many times I mention it in, or read about it, is the idea that, that Enlil wanted us to be designed and, and some of the others wanted us to be designed as, designed as simply a primitive worker. But Ia, with the help of, um, of Ninma, ended up designing us as a being that could even reach a higher state of energy than them. Try to wrap your head around that. That's why it sickens me so much to see what goes on in our world. Because we, if we're able to go down this, at the end of the show, we're going to talk about human states of energy and how you can reach higher states and all of these different things. But if, if people were able to reach those higher states, like all these, these um, famous people in history, like Gandhi and Buddha and all these others that everyone's got a lot of different names for, they're just simply humans that are either incarnated from someone important or they're people who have managed to reach their high, one of their highest states of energy. That's all it is. And so when they do that, they become, you know, they become legends. 
because they're able to pass down teachings and understandings and affect those around them on such a fundamental level that they become, um, they become like milestones in, in, in history and milestones in reality because of the impact they've made. Okay. And that means that to get back to it. So Ia secretly created the human avatar, this body that we have to have what are called chakra centers of energy. And a lot of people hear that word. They think it's just silly, um, terms for people that are hippies and all these things. And it's, we've got to get past that. This is the essential. These are the essential aspects of what makes up our biological, physical body. Okay. And what, and if what it allows us to reach higher states. So what that means is this, everything comes down to energy and vibration. And as a, a, a human reaches these higher states of awareness and in health within their body, they're, they're able to raise their vibratory structure, their energy of their body. And when they do that, they basically unlock these different chakras, which exist in the Kundalini of our spinal energy, right? They're able to unlock each one. And as you do that, you're able to reach higher and higher states of consciousness and energy. And that's the very thing that some of these beings don't want. Okay. And that's what Ia, Ia Enki secretly designed us as is are these beings who could eventually in the future, if they will get through the conditioning and, and slavery of their, of their, their species in terms of how we are functioning, if we're able to get past that on this collective level, we can even reach a greater stature and, and, and ability to create them now. So we become the creators of our reality rather than them, them and others dictating how reality goes. If you have, let's just say, just hypothetically, all right? Someone, they were to say, had this mass news announcement that said that there was this massive um, bomb that went off and killed like thousands of people, but it didn't actually happen. You could still cause that reality to to re to become that because every all the people the ones that, that helped to create this reality that's what we are they end up believing that that's true and so they actually manifest it and so it's like they're what those people did die and that becomes reality even though some things didn't actually happen the way that they've been told human beings will believe something for so long and be so conditioned for so long that it almost becomes part of history and we take on the, the energy and the responsibility of maintaining that, even though in many cases there are, there are lies, like how we perceive certain heroes and certain individuals throughout history. So when Enlil and some of these others found out that we had the potential to reach this heightened state of our energy, they were, they were furious. And, and we're going to talk about what the, the anti, anti-diluvial differences with uh, the disasters that occurred and what happened with the divergence and everything. But it simply means there, there became a great divide with these beings to the point where they hated each other and they would start wars with each other over the idea of, because it was very important to them, what is, two things, what is the future of earth and what is the future of the human race? Those are the two things that are the most interest to not just them, but many, many others. Because if you're an advanced being, you, you have the capability, and you've seen this in so many places, they talk about this, you have the ability to see timelines. You can perceive timelines. So you could actually say, you could have the ability to look far into our future and, and say, what is that being going to eventually reach? And if that's something that could be a threat, threat to them, not in a physical way, but in a way where they become they take over their, their own reality to become greater beings and, 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 and such. You would, some of them don't want that because you, you can, they can feed off the energy of, of everything that's here because we're, what we're essentially doing is giving up all of our creative energy that I'm going to talk about. It's called Ba, B-A. All of our creative energy that the Egyptians called that, we're giving it up freely to them. That's essentially how this works because we're not using it for any kind of creation. We're simply using it to do manual labor and, and really simplistic things in a lot of cases. There are people, doctors, and a lot of people that do really hard things. I, I completely understand that. But, what, but at the end of the day, you look at the fact that we're working 40 to 60 hours a week, in some cases more, and all of our time is simply being stolen. And that's the whole point, to make us look at reality as the means of just uh, an ape that got here and needs to just keep working because that's how the whole, that's how reality works. 
when in reality we're nothing to do with that and we're nothing like that at all, okay? And so this divide became this struggle in war that I call the, the struggle of the, of, the, of, the, of the eagle versus the serpent because these different gods carried different symbols, powerful symbols that would represent themselves and, uh, and others that were, that were part of them. And then civilizations who the certain kings and um, the bloodlines that were carried down to certain individuals that would carry on the same structure, they essentially would mimic those that would had influenced them. So that's why you see all the empire civilizations of the world have eagles and different variations of that. And then you see any kind of a conscious civilization culture have either a serpent or a dragon because a dragon essentially is a serpent that simply metamorphosizes. And that's one of the things that's hammered in almost everything you see with these ancient um, Sumerian civilizations and, 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 and anything out of Mesopotamia is this idea of wings the caduceus medical symbol, the whole wing idea. It simply just represents the metamorphosis of energy. So if you have a, the metamorphosis of the symbol of a serpent, which is a symbolic representation to represent that side, is higher knowledge, balance, wisdom, okay? What does the snake do? It sheds its skin all the time, like transformation. And that's, there's a lot of reasons why these, these beings are, beyond intelligent. There's a lot of reasons why they chose the certain symbols they, they did because those symbols, like we have on the screen right here, Thoth chose the symbol of the Ibis because it's a patient, patient teacher of mankind. These are, these are birds that slowly and patiently and methodically, um, they feed and they, and they, and they, and they exist. They, and that's, and that's the mentality he wanted to show this patient teacher. That's, and so none of these symbols that show these animals and the, and these references, that's nothing to do with what they look like. We got to get past that. We got to, we got to look at this from a metaphorical view in a symbolic view and look at what are they trying to tell us? What are they trying to tell us about human energy, about energy, uh, consciousness and energy of the, of the planet? And what are they trying to tell us about all this stuff? And that's what we're going to, we're going to get into. So, so as you, you may have noticed, um, the conquerors of our world and our flags, if you do a little research and look up, just go look up eagle flags of history. Go look at how many there have been and you'll quickly be like shocked and, and sit down and say to yourself, so the, the war, the, the, which, what does eagle mean? It represents seeing everything from above and being the, the controller and, and dominating everything and being a war power. That's what it, the eagle means. It has nothing to do with a beautiful eagle bird, okay? It's the symbol. And so you look all around the world at these civilizations and they've conquered the serpent and the, and the dragon. There's, not, there's really nothing left. The last ones on our entire planet that existed were the Druids and they were wiped out by St. Patrick, Patrick and his thugs when they, during St. Patrick's Day. Um, that whole holiday celebrating the cleansing of Ireland and, and Northern Scotland and that whole area. That's simply wiping out and eradicating the last society that still practice the knowledge of the ancient serpent dragon. And that's why you see the Aztecs and the Mayans, and you go all the way across to the, all the Asian cultures and all around the world. It's just the same thing. And we're going to get into some Slavic um, mythology too that a lot of people don't know about that talks about the same thing as well. So what do I have on the screen? Well, I want to talk about where possibly these beings came from, I, I already mentioned, I think that they likely came from somewhere far outside our solar system. And the evidence for that is, is really fascinating, actually. If you think about the idea of like an invading solar system or something that's very old, and you look at a lot of this, the Pioneer 10 data from, you know, we were talking about in previous shows, looking at the fact that there's a, a dead binary sun that has been it's been this conspiracy that they haven't told us about that's been influencing it has, that has a, pl a planets potentially, or at least a, a large planet that's potentially been impacting our outer solar system. And, and, and maybe part of this story all along, maybe part of the idea of, of where all of this began and why there's been so much destruction in our solar system. Um, and so in codex number two of the Nag Hammadi script, scriptures, which I highly recommend people read the Nag Hammadi scriptures, represents which the word nog is snake so it's basically like snake knowledge it's representing one of the best collections that exist from gnostic writings from the ancient past which is eventually became rewritten and turned into into modern christianity long, much later after 
Now I want to read, um, I want to read a section from tablet number two of the Emerald Tablets. And basically what these are is they represent what are combined to collectively be called Hermetic writings because Hermes was one of these, these influences um, from that has been, you can see all, all throughout history of these certain individuals who have these traits that keep getting carried and they keep following the same story and Hermes and a lot of the other, other ones are just these incarnations of these beings like Thoth. Okay. Right. And what Thoth says is, is that he was um, from Atlantis. Okay. He came from Atlantis. And if you look in the Emerald tablets, it's very clear that when Atlantis was being destroyed, he left and he went and he's the one who built the pyramids of Egypt. And he, and then he left when he was kicked out by Ra, when they switched over to the solar calendar. Cause he's a, he's, he was the, the crescent moon god he was he was the one who was part of part of the lunar calendar a lot of people don't know that so he leaves egypt and he goes and starts the mesoamerican cultures and he was the, he was one of these he was an ibis in um in this the symbol of the ibis represented in egypt but he was usually referenced represented in other incarnations and in other times as a serpent and dragon as being part of ia's legacy and he's part of that side you had, you remember this division between those who wanted to help humanity reach higher states of energy and consciousness and those who want to not allow that and not allow us to reach those states. Okay. So one of the neatest things about this is in the Emerald tablets, which is one of these ancient, 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 um, ancient, ancient writings that goes back to, we don't even know the origins of it, but it goes back to so long ago that it, it's, it's likely just carried on from Atlantean knowledge. And that's because that's what Thoth says right in it. Okay. And what he says in, in, uh, and I want to make another important point. A lot of people don't, some people, there's a group of society out there that thinks the Emerald tablets aren't real and they've been made, they've been written by someone to trick us and all these things. Go look at how many famous people in history, such as Isaac Newton, who use the Emerald tablets to literally figure out their theories on reality. Okay. What the Emerald tablets do is they provide such conclusive evidence that we just keep verifying that it would be impossible that it would be a, a fake thing because if it was fake, why would it be truth? I mean, I've read the Emerald tablets and it would be an amazing fakery. I, I mean, I don't, I couldn't see how it could be, you know, a fake. It's like every answer is there, right? It's, it's amazing. And, and I want to read a section on this because it talks about these beings these great Anuna beings, it, talk, it doesn't mention them by name, but it, but it mentions, you know, them being part of this and, and where they came from and how these beings really are, um, we're, we're the children of them. We, we're, we're in the design and the essence of them, okay? And that's why there's so many common references to children. And I'm gonna, so I'm going to read a, a segment from, from tablet number two where it says, far in, the, in a past time, Lost in space-time, the children of light look down on the world. Seeing the children of men in their bondage, bound by a, the force that came from beyond, knew they that only by freedom from bondage could man ever rise from the earth to the sun. Down they descended in created bodies, taking the semblance of men as their own. The masters of everything set after their forming, we are they who were formed from the space dust, partaking of life from the infinite all, living in a world as children of men, like and yet unlike the children of men. Then, then for a dwelling place far beneath the earth's crust, blasted great spaces by their power, living in the world as children of men, surrounded them by the forces and power, shielded from harm, they, the halls of the dead. Side by side, then, placed they other spaces, filled them with life and with light from above. Builded they then the halls of Amenti, that they might dwell eternally there, living with life to eternity's end. Thirty and two were there of their children, sons of the lights, who had come among men, seeking to free from the bondage of darkness those who were bound by the force from beyond. So one of the things that he mentions there that's so fascinating is, well, many things, but one of them is the halls of Amenti, okay? 
And right now we're seeing all these discoveries being made with all these tunnels under the pyramids of Giza, where some of these areas underneath and these tunnels and these openings may be more extensive than even what's on the surface. That is something that people have to wrap their minds around is that the surface may be just be one of the places where a lot of these secrets lie. And most of them may actually be underground because these beings are very smart. They know and they look at Earth's history that there have been so many cataclysms and destruction that have occurred that they can't risk losing everything on the surface. You know, you're not going to lose the Great Pyramids because they're so huge. And that's one of the reasons why he built them besides energy. It was also to be a beacon for the future. But also, if you build underground, you know that it'll be protected. It's in some, in some, in some ways forever. So one of the greatest discoveries that's going to be made in the future is going to lie in these tunnels underneath the Great Pyramids. Where now, hasn't the NASA taken over an aspect of the Giza Pyramid? Have they what? Now, hasn't, haven't they taken over some aspect of the, uh, the research at the Giza Pyramid? Well, we just saw that a huge announcement just get made that I think everybody's been waiting for where they discovered that there's electromagnetic energy that's been right. perfectly tuned within the Great Pyramid of Giza, which everybody in, in our circle has been just waiting for because we, we knew that. Um, and, that's, and, and that's simply just the, the component that is about harnessing the energy because there's no writings or anything in the pyramids and there's never been any pharaohs found in them. Those are all lies. They're simply massive energy power plants. But here's the question. What were they powering more than 10,000 years ago? And I think the answer to that has to do with two things, either um, connecting to the highest states of energy that can be, that can be utilized for creation and, 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 uh, and affecting um, human energy, as well as potentially even changing the energy grids of the planet. Because these pyramids are built right on the ley lines and these special energy um, se segments of our planet, which is simply just this this sphere surrounded by electromagnetic energy. That's what everything is. That's why, that's why Tesla um, discovered free energy. He was simply just utilizing the electromagnetic energy of our planet that it creates. That's what these pyramids are. That's what all of these designs are all around the world from ancient mounds you see out in Mexico in the Southwest, all the way to, to, temp, to temple pyramids and then all the way to these large pyramids. They, in many ways, had a, the same purposes. Slightly different things at times, but, it, but overall, they had the same purposes about energy. Um, and so Thoth from Atlantis says that these, that these beings came from beyond, and they started using humans to incarnate into, and they would hide in them and, be, and pretend they were man and, and do all these, you know, it makes you think, if they were the ones responsible for new, maybe they were the ones responsible for new inventions and not just some random person tinkering, if you consider the fact that they mentioned how many times they keep incarnating and using people and, and, using, and using us for, for, for different means. And they call themselves the children of light. And, okay. And they, and they say that they were, they were created when space, like back when sp um, everything was being formed from space time. And that's it's mind blowing. And it, but it really echoes the idea that they may be millions of years old. And that's why we can't, we can't wrap our heads around how complex all of this is because they're just so far beyond um, our capability of, of consciousness that, that we're just trying to pick up the scraps and pieces of all this without really understanding probably what the larger picture of all this, of all this is. Right. I mean, there's so much. I mean, if you're just starting to get into this and discover these uh, tablets and these old writings, it's so much to digest and there's so much to, to, to cipher through. It's, you know, it's hard to, to tell the truth. But um, I mean, you know, with people like you getting all this excellent information out there, it's making it uh, more abundant for people to understand what actually happened in our past. Exactly. And take something like the Emerald Tablets. Again, more proof that you know they're not fake. Try to follow them. That's what I did. I took the teachings that were in there and I said, I want to see, and, and the ancient cultures all around the world, like the Gnostics, I said to myself, it's not about just writing about this stuff. I want to, I want to see that this is why one of the reasons I'm so passionate is I, I've seen some of these higher states of energy by following these, these, this curriculum of, of how you can raise your vibration and all these different means. And, and when you do have these incredible experiences that, that go along with, with doing this, you are forever changed and you, and you know that it's real because you, 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 
experience it directly. And, you know, walking outside in a higher state of energy and being so much more connected to your consciousness and all these other things, all of a sudden reality just becomes completely different and you, your perspective on how you viewed everything changes. And a lot of your activities change and what you used to do that was maybe just passing the time by then becomes doing things that actually make, create experiences and grow and grow you. And, and that's why there's such a difference in it um, between certain segments of society because you have one segment that starts to learn about this stuff and just goes on, you know, uh, the deepest rabbit hole ever and is considered crazy and a lunatic because on the other side, these, some of society that's been given this Monday viewpoint, they look at some of this stuff without doing any of the studying or, or looking any of the history or the evidence and it just looks crazy to them. And I would just like to bring up something that I bring up all the time, but it's just so important is if you were, if you were around hundreds of years ago and you were told that there were giant lizards that were the size of buildings and houses running around all of the earth, stomping around, eating each other, these huge lizards, you would laugh your head off. I know I would. You would laugh your head off. And right. it, but it was amazing though, is if you take that same group and then you, you bring them into a building and you start going, look at all these bones. You ever seen bones like this before? And you start putting them together to show this model of a, of a, of a skeleton of an enormous lizard. And, you, and all of a sudden what became crazy is no longer crazy anymore. It simply seemed crazy because you didn't have the necessary information to be able to weigh and compare what you're, look, you're looking at. And so all you have to do is, is well, not all you have to do, it's, it's a hard road, but by going down the road of, of accumulating this knowledge and, and doing this, you're able to separate yourself out to know that there's all, all this stuff is existing. A lot of it's real, some of it might not be but a lot of it's real and, and it's our job to find out what's real. When you agree? I would definitely agree. And that's exactly why I do this show is to, uh, to get the truth out there or what could possibly be the truth about our history and everything that's going on that we don't know about. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and I, so I want to go into this next topic. It's one of these topics that again, I, br I brought up that dinosaur thing because we're going to be talking about, giants and the nephilim and fallen angels and now i wanted to say before you get into yeah. this i've been fascinated with the 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 giant mythos um especially you uh hear it in the book of enoch it was removed from the bible probably for a, a very good reason and um and I'm, i'd love to hear what you have to say about this go ahead sure so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna have some discussions about this and i want to bring some facts to the table not just Again, like that, that, that evidence thing we were just talking about. Let's bring some facts to discuss this. Remember, we were talking about how the Anuna are very tall. You see that in a lot of places, right behind Chris on the wall there on his poster. That's the famous um, giant seated from Sumeria where they have, you know, one of these great beings that's standing, you know, far above all the rest. That's simply a fact. They were much taller than we were, Okay. That's you can see that everywhere, all over these writings. They didn't, they didn't simply represent their stature as great greatness. You know, you make them larger than life because of that. It wasn't about that. They were actually were very large, and that and we're going to get into evidence that proves that. Okay, and that's why you've, if you look at the statues that have been created from a lot of those beings, they're almost all the same size. Think about that. Compare the facial sizes and how large these are. You'll find that all over the world, these statues of a lot of these are actually created with a, a, the same exact size, which is, which is pretty amazing in itself. And you, you, you just opened it up mentioning the Book of Enoch. In the Book of Enoch, it goes into great detail about these fallen angels. And if you want to understand giants in the Nephilim, you have to first understand what fallen angels are because they're directly connected in all of this. First of all, there's no such thing as angels and there's no such thing as, um, as demons. It's just simply references to place something in a certain um, framework to understand it, okay? Because some of these angels are actually pretty bad beings. And some of those who we think are like Satan, the devil, and all these bad other beings are actually not bad at all because the modern church ended up creating incredible confusion when they, they took all of these things that are not supposed to be literal and they, they designed it in such a way where people are so, a lot of people are so confused because of it, because of what they've done about the whole heaven and hell thing. 
Heaven is simply higher dimensions. Hell is simply lower states of energy where, where, where energy is managed and, and manipulated. That's what essentially it is. And the underworld, which is considered the same as hell, is not a bad place at all. It's, it's simply, again, it represents where energy is managed. Okay? These they terms don't to confuse us. Yeah, these terms have been incredibly perverted. And that means taking their true meanings and not only inver inverting them, but making them, turning one into like a demonic term that has nothing to do with it. Take an example of, before I get going, continue on this. Take an example of Satan. Satan, this figure, has this pitchfork, right? And at, this, at the same time, if you look at the trident carried by all kinds of references showing what, what most likely is probably Enki, Ea, and showing Poseidon with his trident, right. you see very quickly that, that the pitchfork is simply the inverted version of the trident. That's it. That's all it is. And that's, that's why all this stuff has been manipulated so much. So the Book of Enoch, which is one of the most important Gnostic set of writings ever written, along with like the Nag Hammadi scriptures, was just very cleverly written out of the modern Bible because of what it contained. It talked about these fallen angels. It talked about, you know, the Nephilim. What, what, what are those terms? Well, fallen angels, what it means is if these beings, these, on, these Anuna beings, these Anunnaki beings exist in higher dimensions and there's these higher dimensional beings, they're more advanced. It, what the term fallen means is if they did something very wrong, they were cast down and, and they were no longer immortal, essentially like eternal. And they were forced down into our reality and they had to, they had to live out either existing here in this, in, this, in this reality of this realm or they had to live out being an actual um, physical being that could die. And so the, the term fallen angels means, means that they were cast down to the, to the physical realm of earth. And, they were, and some of them were forced to remain here and they ended up causing chaos because of it, okay? And so what that means is one of the most common reason why they'd be called fallen angels is that they would come down, some of them would come down and end up having promiscuous acts with females because female women are beautiful. That's not, that's just, not just my perspective, they are. They're, they're beautiful and they they attracted some of these beings who, you know, look at how, en look at how Enlil views the human race. He called us beasts who never deserved the these divine genetic gifts that were given to us. So if you have that mentality held by some of them, where they don't think that we ever should have had this given to us in the first place, that's one of the, one of the things that justifies their reasoning by keeping us in a lower state of energy because they don't think we deserve it. So if you have that mentality, and you have some of these beings that mate with mortal women, that was seen as a, an incredibly um, despicable act. And so that they were then kicked out from this, this realm, this higher dimensional conscious place that they exist in, and they were forced into our realm to stay here eternally. Okay? Now, and that's where, that's why we had these, these terms with, you know, the Michael, these archangels and all these different things in all throughout religion. Okay. Now, what is the Nephilim? The Nephilim means any of these fallen angels, these fallen, these Anunnaki were cast down for having promiscuous acts with, with, with mortal women. Any of those women who gave birth to a child who was directly crossed um, with these genetics, those were the Nephilim. Now, because these, the, the, here's the evidence. Because um, if you look at all the evidence, we're going to go over all this stuff that mentions the Nephilim and, and, and the evidence for giants in history. Um, they're even shorter than the Anunnaki because they're only half the Anunnaki. Okay. That's why in the Sumerian king list, the reason why we have so many kings that were so tall and lived so long was because they were literally direct crosses of these bloodlines and these, in these Anunnaki branches. Okay. And that's the same thing that continued all throughout reality. Some of them that were in charge, especially some of the negative polarity aspects of it, they realized that they could control our reality by putting certain puppet controllers in, in, in place who were told that they were essentially better than others because they had these elite bloodlines of these, of these Anunnaki and then they've been governing us essentially all along. But things have gotten out of control here. Okay, this wasn't supposed to be this bad. 
it really, it really is um, the, the way that they've controlled us through energy and war and, and, and keeping us in a lower chakra of energy. If you, keep a, um, if you keep a human being in their red root chakra of energy, which is where a being will exist if they're still in a state of fear and, and, and being manipulated through their demiurges, that's what those are. All those primitive urges are demiurges. That's why Thoth in the Emerald Tablets says from a force that came from beyond. There, he's talking about this whole preying on our demiurges thing. By understanding our demiurges so well, if you perpetuate them, you keep us in a lower state of energy. That's what all this is all about, okay? So the Nephilim were all of these offspring of the Anunnaki through these human women, and it got out of control. And, and, and this, by the way, is we're talking about over 100,000 years ago for most, in most cases, okay? Ancient, ancient, long ago. So these offspring are born and you have essentially giants either that are kings or they end up going off and just move, going to some other part of the world or something. And so you have essentially giants all over the world that don't belong there. They're not even designed to exist in this type of world. Again, remember, we're designed to specifically function in this size planet with this electromagnetic gravity sphere because of how tall we are and how our energy is designed. They're not supposed to be here. They're an abomination, okay? Right. Because of that, that was one of the reasons why these beings allowed a, a, such a devastating combination of events to occur that led to this deluge because they wanted to, some of them, some of the interests at B wanted to restart the whole experiment that was here because it became out of control. There was, it was Nephilim everywhere. And they were causing our genetics and our, and our, and our, um, our future to be skewed and, and changed. So um, if you, if you read in uh, the King James Bible, if you want to see some of these references, it's pretty amazing. It's, it states in the King James Bible, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bore children to them, the same became the mighty men, which were the old men of renown. So think of something like Hercules. So all, of these, all of these great heroes, all of these great kings, they're all simply these, these, these crosses of these special genetics of the Anunnaki. That's why they were so strong and so tall and lived so long, and that's, that's all it is. And over time, our genetics have both been downgraded, and it's just been so long since then that, that a lot of those gifts have been lost. We still have tremendous gifts, but it's largely, they're largely dormant inside our genome. And we can, we're going to talk about why that is and then uh, later on at the end. So, and we also, we also killed off most of these giants ourselves. Yes, that? and that's what I'm about to get into. Now, okay. I mentioned that quote from the King James Bible. It says, there were giants in the earth in those days. And then remember it says the sons of God came down that are just simply talking about the Anunnaki. These fallen, it's the same thing. They just use different terms. Okay. Now what that means is eventually over time, um, armies and, and different uh, aspects were hunting these giants down and killing whatever was left. Because w one of the, the hardest aspects to understand about this is this history that the King's James Bible is talking about is talking about after this deluge, because the giants weren't all killed. A lot of them were, but a lot of them, some of them went into these massive caverns in the earth and they survived. And that's why it says they were, there were giants in the earth and then in those days and then after, because whatever, whatever survived through these caverns and came back out became these legends, became these legends of fighting these giants. And then whatever was left over within these, um, these famous Kings and these other beings who were had still these leftover genetics that still made them taller. You got to think of this, these different bloodlines where you have, you know, like the, probably these purebred bred Nephilim that have been around, you know, for long periods of time. And then you have these, where are they probably mated with another woman along the way who mated with another one. So over time, every time you get a, a small, a, a shorter and shorter person, even though they still have a lot of those traits. So right. that's why I think you get, not all of them are the same height and that's that's why you get all those those alterations but basically after the the deluge which we're, we're going to talk about they were essentially hunted to extinction and and uh and chris i don't know if you want to mention anything before i move on but um oh 
no, go ahead. Uh, keep going. We, uh, you know, we've got uh, about 30 minutes or so okay. left. Yeah, I got to keep going. I got to keep going. <laughs> now, this is one of my favorite pieces of evidence that I'm, I'm excited to talk about, okay? I'm going to move the move this over. This is on the way here. So I'm, I'm putting up one of the maps that was drawn. Shows basically, look at the, the circle that's uh, on the right. And it shows the size of a person and it shows what look like giants. This was an old map that was drawn, okay, from way back in the day. Now, there's an interesting piece of evidence that I have um, talked about a few, only I think once, and it's in the new book. I talk about it a lot, but it's this idea of, well, what evidence do you have that they were actually around? One of the best pieces of evidence that proves that giants in the Nephilim were real comes from one of the most popular figures in history that nobody, that, that, that this certain aspect nobody knows about. So you think of who first circumnavigated the world that we know of, and the name is Magellan, okay? You have all kinds of famous stories about how he traveled around the world and mapped it, and he was the first one, and everyone's like, oh, that's, that's great, but, they don't, but there's more to the story. If you actually look, go look into some of the records that were, that were done by um, the people that were part of the, the party that, that, he, that went with him on these journeys, okay? So you'd have Magellan, who is the head of all this, and then you had certain individuals who were recording the events that happened along the way, okay? Now, one of those individuals basically was talking about what Magellan and his crew encountered in Patagonia, and, and it's so fascinating. I encourage people, please look into this. And it's, and it's, it's fascinating because nobody talks about it and it's not studied or known about. It's one of these suppressed historical aspects that's happened. Now, what, and so in, in 1520, Magellan is trying to sail around the world. And of course, uh, Panama Canal is not there yet. So he's got to go around South America. And while he's going through this area of Patagonia, which is now called the Strait of Magellan, by the way, in that area, it's all jumbled islands and glaciers and mountains. They had to go inland to get food and water. And while they went inland in this remote part of the world where nobody had ever been, he, they record in these, in, these, in these documents, in these writings. That's why this, this map is drawn this way. They record that their party came under attack by, they called giants, giant men, that some of them were over 10 feet tall. That's in the, the records from Magellan and his party, okay? Over 10 feet tall, and they had to fight them and then flee from these, from these regions. These parts of the world that had, that had not been conquered by armies still had these leftover remnants of these giants in the Nephilim. And there's one more that's another, another um, aspect of this that's amazing. Look into some of the Roman stories, some of the stuff that's been written about the Roman armies when they pushed into Germania, which is the region of German, Germany now, they, they had these famous regions where there was these massive forests, these German forests that were no one had really conquered or penetrated, and there was different violent groups, but there was also, there was also remnants of, there was Nephilim giants that were hiding there. That one of these, one of the, that has had to seek refuge in these different places. And so the German, in Germania, the Romans have, have records of how they were fighting giants. Some people don't know that, but it's, that's absolutely true, that they were fighting some of these tall men that sometimes took many, many Romans to, to have to take down and, and kill. And of course, Romans, when the Roman Empire collapsed and, and, and Constantine changed the whole thing over in Constantinople to turn into a Christian, it was called the Holy Roman Empire after that point, because it, it ended up taking Christianity and using it as part of its power. They, of course, wiped all these records, so nobody knows about it. Right? Right. But there's this whole side of giants in the Nephilim that's very real in our history. And it not only shows that giants are real, but it shows that these Anunnaki beings were, were, were much taller than, than humanoids are today. Right, right. And uh, also, I want to ask you briefly about the elongated skulls. Now, did some of them also have elongated skulls like you see uh, that have been recently discovered? Yeah, I definitely think that some of them had um, very tall tall heads and these abnormalities. And I think one of the, and there's another side to it. I think some of the um, cranium enlargement that you see is the idea that they knew that there were, there were beings that were a lot more advanced than them that had given their ancient cultures wisdom and knowledge. And so what they would do is they would try to mimic them by, if you enlarge their cranium, they would try to 
um, show that they were smarter and, and almost like a stature thing of, of being more important. So there's probably two, two reasons why they, they did that in my eyes. And, and Chris, that, Chris, that leads us into what did we lose? What, where did all this go? And I, uh, so I want to bring up, of course, all of the ancient megalithic structures we see on the earth and all of these incredible um, place, locations such as Gobekli Tepe, who have been radiocarbon dated to, you know, over 10,500 years old. And, and on the left, left, you have the enormous stone block at Baalbek, Lebanon, that weighs 1,242 tons. Right. And we're told that was moved by pulleys, slaves okay. with pulleys. Okay. <laughs> Again, we could, I, for the most part, we could not move something like this today. If, if, they, if they could, why don't you ever see large things being moved like that? Okay. The, and not, not even to mention, regardless of that point all along, again, we're told that these cultures were primitive and nomadic. It, it doesn't make any sense. Okay. This is how I, I, I perceive all of this occurring. We have to look at two distinct time periods of human history which are called the antediluvial, okay, or the post-diluvial. And basically what we're talking about is before and after the flood. The flood was very real. It was a combination of the ice age, which was ending, which ended around 12,000 years ago, rapidly, rapidly melting very, very quickly, which by the way, is nothing like we have today. There was, where I'm sitting right now, I had one to two miles of ice above my head. So we're talking about enormous um, ice age that had melted extremely fast and then through other tectonic forces on the earth led to horrible destruction from volcanoes and tsunamis. And, and that's what we think of as the flood. And it wasn't, the whole earth wasn't covered in water at one time, but there was disasters occurring all over the place. And that's why we see so many, the disappearance of so many of these, of these animals right after the ice age, like saber tooth tigers and woolly mammoths, it, it was because the climate changed so rapidly after these events that they simply either froze or died. And it's, so it, when you look at the power and the dramatic occurrences of these events between, call it between 10,500 years ago and 12,800 years ago, because I think there was multiple events that happened. I think it was over the course of over a thousand years. Because of that, all of these civilizations that had developed the Sumerian king list mentions specifically that in Sumer and in these Mesopotamian areas, that kingship was directly lowered to these cities. And then they arose cities like Sharupak and Eridu, whereas then they were destroyed. And then after kingship was relowered again, and you got these new, this new development of, of civilization where you had Uruk and Ur and Kish were erected. So we need to differentiate the fact that these, these are completely different age structures and you can go look at the evidence for Eridu. It's still there. That's what was being compared as the garden of Eden in the story as this being, you know, near the, near the Persian Gulf. And it was one of this, this incredible place that was destroyed, you know, well over 10,000 years ago. Okay. And we still have evidence for that today that shows that. So what does that mean? Well, I don't, Again, I want to make some points out. I don't think that these Anunnaki beings use technology to directly themselves build all these. I do not think that. Ancient aliens' idea that ancient aliens built this, I actually don't believe that. What I think is real, as, of course, ancient aliens are real, but what's, what I think was real was the idea that they then provided the knowledge to these civilizations for how to do it. Okay. Yes, Thoth built the pyramids and was part of that, but he wasn't part of every single uh, um, structure and, and thing around the world. They yeah. they just influenced these cultures on how to do it, how to use either, um, you know, either they they somehow use some kind of a melting polymer to create some of these structures, like you see in South America, or they did some, um, or they use some kind of a sound magnetism. Uh, method to levitate and raise some of these things it's yeah, with simply, sound frequencies uh, yes I've yeah, heard of that. that's it, fascinating it was not like think of physical power of trying to lift them because that would have been impossible we have to get past that that idea um and understand these two distinct time periods now this is what i want to mention so after these advanced civilizations that you know are part of the pyramids and gobekli tepe and all of them once they disappeared from these destruction destructive events you had 
kingship lowered and restarted again, like I said, in, in Kish and these other places in Mesopotamia, this is where it gets important. Those civilizations then became somewhat advanced as well, but then you had conquering armies later go through and basically destroy a lot of the evidence that had been, that had been around for those. So there's a lot of complex factors. You have basically... The, the, the floods and destruction destroys the advanced civilizations, their knowledge, and then it gets restarted and it's starting up again in a lot of different places, especially Mesopotamia. And then there was a decision made. Then there was certain aspects where I think these beings, like you were brought up before, where are they? I think they left. And I think a lot of this fell apart because they weren't here. And these, what they had jumpstarted, these bloodline kings and these armies became, got out of control and they came through and they destroyed everything and they and through other influences of some of these other beings that stayed or, or continued to influence, they basically corrupted and, and destroyed our world. And we're just trying to pick up the pieces of what already existed long ago because there had been a decision made to hide all of this and to destroy it all through the Holy Roman Empire and a lot of other things. They wanted to make sure that they could write the story to, so that certain beings could play the role of God. Like, so God in the modern Bible is not God. It's this, these beings playing this role, this deceitful role to try to hide all this from us. That's why um, so many people are in shock when they start reading the book of Enoch and in the Nakamadi scriptures, because it's so much, goes so much further than what religion is telling us. It actually answers questions rather than just leading to more confusion. And, and if more people could understand a lot of these things, it, I think it would help in our evolution, in our evolution yeah. of our consciousness. And that's a perfect segue in the neck, into the end here. And, the, and we're going to talk about our consciousness. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna discuss the end game here. What's, what is going on right now? What, where are yeah. we going? Are they... You always get a sense that, you know, you're meant for so much more. You get up, you go to work, you come home and you do it all over again every day. You get a couple of days off for, you know, what they call relaxation, but yeah, you're exactly. truly free. That's right. Free time, right? Free time. Oh, you get some free time right now. Yes. I get free time. Why don't we have, why don't we have a, think about a reality where if our economy wasn't so based on manual labor and a lot of the things that we do are done in an automatic way and people's creativity and their, and their energy was used for really important things and people would come together. Think about how that would change our, how we even view our reality and how we view our existence and our purpose. If someone thinks, wow, I'm meant for something a lot greater than just working at McDonald's my whole life and then, and then you know, having a couple of years left when I'm retired before I die. There's so much more to this. And that's why you can't just tell someone this. They have to go down this road to experience themselves when they start reading about all this and understanding the ancient history aspects and understanding what these cultures had tried to tell us all along that was then covered up and destroyed by a lot of sides of this that didn't want it being known, you quickly learn what really defines our consciousness and what defines the experience here and everything changes. Everything you see, everything you, the way you perceive everything changes. And, and like I said, you start changing your life. And now um, there's two terms I want to bring up. The ancient Egyptians had very important terms that separates the different physical and non-physical states of our energy. So they said, and the Gnostics echoed, um, basically, which is just Egyptian knowledge, they echoed the idea that the physical reality we see around us is the major controlling point that keeps us trapped, okay? Because if our, if our energy at its, at its heart is based on a non-physical conscious eternal energy that is, you could say it's stuck here, and I want to just bring that up for a second. One of the, some of the writings talk about how these beings created some kind of a soul trap system here where they could feed off of our energy by creating the means for which it was so hard to reach ascension that 99% of the, the beings that were there never could. And so they were stuck in an incar incarnation cycle endlessly. Now, what that means is if you were forced to kill someone in, the, in a war or you're forced to do bad things, you, because you're you're in a system here where you can't ascend beyond reaching your higher states of energy and leaving this cycle that's been developed here through taking advantage of this energy system of the planet and all the different means that they do. 
if you're killing people and you're doing all these different acts in your lifetime, you have to try to clear your conscience and clear those, those actions before you can ascend. That's what Osiris in, in Egypt, all, that, all those teachings talk about. Look at how it says these pharaohs, when they were going to the afterlife, they had to have their conscious, conscious weighed, their heart weighed. What did that mean? They show scales. If you have fear and, and unresolved things within yourself, if you don't resolve them, you'll never, re, never be able to reach higher states of energy and you'll be stuck in an incarnation cycle endlessly. You keep, and so what do they do? Well, some of these beings who have been in control of this time of Pisces, this zodiacal time of Pisces, that have created such a negative polarity here. Before we go into a, what will be a very positive polarity in Aquarius, it has to be, it alternates, okay? Before it happens though, they were able to, by the rules of balance that they follow, to, um, to create the means for which, because of the rules of free will here, because we can decide whatever we want, they, they made the game so that, look at today, right now, if you decide you don't want to pay taxes or get a job or do anything, you go out in the middle of the wild summer, you build a cabin, you're like, this is amazing. I'm living off the land. Someday, one day, someone finds out you're out there and you go to jail because you haven't paid taxes in 10 years. And why are you paying taxes? You're not, you're not working. You're not doing anything because there's a, there's a system in place here that's been designed where everybody has to follow this, these rules of this system. And, that, and those rules keep everybody in this certain state. Now, if you, if you then take that system and you create chaos all the time through orchestrating wars and all of these mass suffering and fear and dumbing us down through food and all these various means, you can create a, mean, a, a way where, yes, hey, you're, you have free will. You can reach whatever state of energy you want here. Oh, but I've, we've designed the game where it's going to be almost impossible to get there because of all the factors and things that come into play to do it. It's this perfect way where you, you have free, the law, the, the, because of the laws of free will, it forces us to essentially keep reincarnating over and over again and giving our energy because we don't, in our, in our short little mortality of only you know, 120 years that our, our cells have been capped at, that they start to get degrade and we die, um, we, we don't have a lot of time. We don't have a lot of time to figure it out. So we just keep doing this over and over again, right? Until, until our solar system enters into our galactic center of our Milky Way, like right now. And some of these beings knew that despite all this, the energy slavery and all the things that could happen, they knew that eventually we would reach these higher states of consciousness, regardless of all the means that try to prevent it, simply because when you reach the galactic center, the energy is so much higher and your vibration goes up. You, it's almost like a, a boiling pot of water on an oven that you cannot hold in any longer. And that's where we are now. At this point right now, there's a war in our reality, in our world, to both condition people further, hiding the truth, and to try to create some kind of a, a you know, draconian uh, one world government where people lose all ability to have freedom to ever reach their highest state to, to put a stop to all, all that's going on right now. And that's where we are right now. I mean, we're you hear it all the time that we're living in some sort of simulation uh, or like it's like a training ground for so that we can actually ascend. It is. It, it, they call it a holographic universe. It doesn't mean everything's fake. It simply means that everything comes down to certain levels, strings of vibration. It's called super string theory. Everything is, is vibrating a certain rate and everything is being affected by the electromagnetic spectrum of another body, another object. The larger an object is, the more electromagnetic energy it has to affect something else around it. That's why when, because we're these beings that have the electrical circuits flowing through our, our water charge system, when you, your aura, your energy, you get around somebody else and you haven't fine-tuned it, you, you get drawn into their state of energy. That's, give me an example. You're having a great day. You, you feel happy. You feel fantastic. And you're walking down the street and you meet your neighbor and they're crying their eyes out. They just said that their son was just hit by a car and they start telling you all the details. What happens to your state of energy? You match theirs, don't you? That's how we work. We, unless you can have the control of your energy and you can, you can not allow others to impact you, which is really hard. You essentially, the collective of humanity is this 
has this means where we all are functioning on almost the same level of energy because we're all inf being influenced by those around us. That's why wireless signals and all these things disrupt us on such a level be and because of those factors. So the Egyptians said, getting back to it, they said that the, the great, in the Gnostics, the great illusion of our, of our, of our reality that holds everyone back in the, in the vice, in the chains of our reincarnation cycle of energy over and over again is the illusion of the physical world. Because at its deepest level, we're all just energy that's trying to reach higher states. That's it. Energy trying to reach a higher state. And so that's why they call the creative energy within us of, of higher energy called Ba energy. And it's the, ba, it's the energy of creation. Meanwhile, the, the energy, Ka, the, the illusion of the phys physical world, if someone becomes so focused on that, on just dominating the physical world, they're almost, they're just, they're just caught in their own, they're, they're chasing their own tail if you think about it, because that's just going to force them to be stuck in an endless cycle forever. So right now to end out, here we are with these higher states of vibration that you can't help, but just happen. That's why so many people are just one day, they're just rapidly changing when they see something, it's just triggering them. And when you start learning this, you know, deep inside that there's so much more to us than we're being told. And so it resonates and people go down this path and it changes them forever. And that's going to be, that's going to happen on a faster and faster level now as we get to this point. So here we go right now. The human experience is, is human experience here is realizing collectively that we're all part of something much greater and part of something much more than just competing against each other and survival of fittest as an, as an animal. And that's why religion in many parts of the, of the, of the world, like the United States in Canada and in a lot of places in Europe, is starting to lose significant members while other places in the world may be gaining them in some ways. A lot of the more industrial sized, industrialized countries in the world are rapidly losing religion because religious members, because people are becoming spiritual because they're realizing what reality is and what they're part of. And it's changing the, the funda fundamentals of everything that they, that they experience. So right. I just want to, I want to end out Chris and just say, uh, I really appreciate our discussions and everything. And um, oh, well, Matt, that was awesome. I mean, like I said earlier, the key to everyone understanding where we're going is looking back in the past and you do an awesome job of showing us what happened. And uh, Matt, thank you so much for coming on. That was an amazing presentation and we're definitely going to have you back. And uh, definitely after the book, we're, we're very much looking forward to that. Thank you so much, Chris. I really appreciate everything. And, I look forward to another discussion again.